The next presenter is um, the Honorable Judge Christopher Stride from Lake County. He's the um, 18th Judicial Circuit Court, presided over um, a landmark case in Deerfield where the parents were held responsible for allowing alcohol and to be served in a home and there's tragic consequences. Judge Stride. Good evening. Uh, nice to be back here in DuPage County. Just in case you're not quite sure, Lake County is the most northeastern county in the state. It's sort of a DMZ between Packer fans and Bear fans. Um, it, it's also uh, a very socioeconomically diverse county. Uh, we have extreme wealth, we have extreme poverty. Uh, it's about 800,000 residents. Uh, it, it, in many ways, mirrors DuPage. It's, uh, I think, I'll, most often compared to County of all the powers. A little bit about myself. I spent 12 years as a prosecutor uh, in Lake County. Uh, spent another four years uh, doing civil work as well as defense work. Um, tried reckless homicide cases, um, tried drug cases, tried murders. Uh, I've heard a dozen murders as a judge. Um, I was a felony backup judge for the last seven years. And then in July of 2014, I was appointed presiding judge of our specialty courts, which is our drug court, our veterans treatment and assistance court, and our mental health court. So I always kiddingly say I went to law school because there was no math or science involved, and now I'm up to my eyeballs in psychiatry, psychology, and addiction. I should have paid more attention in college. But uh, in any event, uh, I was appointed in 2005. And in the uh, fall of 2006, uh, two people in Deerfield named Sarah and Jeffrey Hutzel um, were uh, at home with their uh, son, uh, Tyler, who was home from college. He had graduated the year before from Deerfield High School. And he was going to Kansas, in Lawrence, uh, Kansas, KU, Jayhawks, if you follow the basketball team. And uh, he went, it just happened to be the Deerfield High School homecoming football game. So Tyler decided that he'd get a bunch of his friends that were underclassmen and some of his friends that had graduated but hadn't gone off to school and, and, and head over to the high school football game. Prior to leaving, uh, they decided that they were going to take some water bottles, uh, empty out all the water and fill up with vodka, so they had a little something to sip on during the high school football game. Uh, and that's what they did. Uh, after a while, they decided to leave the football game and uh, they went to the Hutzel's house. Now you can sort of see the Hutzel's house in the background of this photograph. And, uh, this photograph will become important later, but just to set it up a little bit. Uh, the Hutzel's were uh, enormously successful people. And I would go so far as to say, uh, probably in this audience tonight uh, is some, somebody very similarly situated to Sarah Jo Hutzel. Who were they? Well, he was the CFO of a, a very large company. Uh, he had, uh, was completely self-made, put himself through college, got his MBA from Harvard. Mrs. Hustle was uh, very, very uh, successful in the community herself. She was enormously involved in uh, a number of different uh, organizations. They were hugely involved in their church. Uh, they uh, went so far as to create within their church youth group a Katrina relief team that on, uh, for two consecutive summers went down to the New Orleans area, uh, basically on a combination, combination mission and uh, sort of charity trip to help folks that had lost so much during Hurricane Katrina. Really, really good people. Uh, they are also people that made probably the worst decision that any parent could make ever. So in any event, the, Mr. Hustle bought this beautiful home in Deerfield, which was sort of down a long private driveway. But that's the actual driveway to turn into the house. And you'll see two trees that sort of vaguely form a V. The tree along the driveway, closest to the driveway, uh, immediately to the left of the driveway, uh, is the tree uh, that unfortunately uh, became involved in a uh, completely horrific way later that evening. So anyway, my Tyler's there. And as high school parties are one to do, it gets bigger. Uh, the interesting, interesting thing about the Hutzel's house is it was a 
massive house and they had a four car garage, a test garage, and you could access the basement through the garage. So the kids didn't have to go to the front door of the house. They could just go through the garage, which was open, down the stairs into sort of this beautifully finished basement. Um, and that became uh, an issue of contention during the trial. Well, not surprisingly, as many as 50 kids, they think, were in the basement of that house. And uh, one of the kids was a boy named uh, Danny Bell. And Danny had graduated the year before with Tyler from Deerfield High School. Uh, and Danny was uh, going to the College of Lake County, almost the same thing as the College of DuPage, uh, community college, real good community school. And uh, Danny decided that he wanted to drink beer when he got home, or got off of his shift at a local pizza place. And he went over to the hotels and started drinking beer in the basement. The law at the time in the state of Illinois, and this was a, you know, it's, it's funny to sit here and say I was part of a landmark case. I, you know, I promise you I didn't raise my hand and say, please give me this landmark case, because this was about as intense a thing as I had ever seen. I remember, I had tried a dozen murder cases as a prosecutor. I tried you know, more rape cases than I could count. I handled hate crime cases, I handled high profile cases. This thing took on a life of its own uh, when the trial started. Uh, we're talking every Chicago newspaper, we're talking every network news uh, uh, channel in Chicago uh, had uh, reporters covering it. We're talking the local Pioneer Press, the local Joaquin paper. You couldn't, um, you know, you couldn't swing a star from that hidden member of the media in that courtroom during this trial, which lasted about six days. Anyhow, party gets crazy, gets very loud. Um, Danny and a boy who arrived later at the party named Ross Trace, as well as three other boys, decided that they were going to leave the party, go up into Danny's uh, sort of jacked up Volkswagen, and get high. Now, Ross just got to the party. Ross hadn't had a thing to drink. Uh, Ross had not had a thing to smoke, and they got into the back of that car and everybody got high. And then Danny decided he wanted to see how fast he could get that Volkswagen going down this private drive that led to the Hudson's house. So he goes to the end and then he punches it. And uh, the reconstructionist testified at trial that by the time he made the turn, you really can't see it so great on this photograph. You, you may be able to see some sort of pink, uh, spray pink. Uh, what that is, is that's the car turning into the driveway off the street and sort of bottoming out, you know, sort of what I do remember from physics. The car sort of dove down, hit the ground, and took out some gouges of the pavement. That's the undercarriage of the Volkswagen. That's how fast it was going. And then it goes down that driveway, and this is where that tree along the left-hand side of the driveway comes in. Uh, that tree was struck by that Volkswagen. And when the tree, when the Volkswagen hit the tree, the driver's side sort of dove down into it. And the part of the vehicle that uh, connects the, the hood of the vehicle to the roof of the vehicle is typically referred to as the pillar. So the, the driver's side, um, uh, the driver's side pillar also struck that tree. And when it did that, the roof of the Volkswagen separated from the pillar and then peeled back. Uh, sort of like, imagine opening a can of cat food or a can of tuna. It was sort of that same uh, motion. Um, when that happened, it came down across the top of Ross Trace's forehead and took off the top of his head and was killed instantly. Uh, also when that happened, uh, it threw Danny Bell from the driver's side of that vehicle. The vehicle sort of spun and came to rest uh, right at sort of the, the uh, opening of the driveway where you could go to the right to the garage and go to the left to the front door. The boys that were in the vehicle are covered with glass, they're bleeding. They run into the house, they're screaming, call 911. Uh, they call 911. Uh, it took about seven minutes for the police to get from uh, where they were dispatched to in Deerfield to the Hutzel's house. Within that seven minutes, and I'll imagine we're, we have high school kids, every kid in that house was gone. It's like they weren't even there, they disappeared. In that seven minutes, not a Red Solo cup of beer, not a bottle of beer, not a can of beer, not a bottle of rum, not a bottle of Seagram's, 
nothing was left out. It was all cleaned up and put into trash cans. When the police got there, uh, they go down into the basement, and the first officer on the scene responded by saying when he walked into the basement, he was struck by the overwhelming smell of alcohol in that house. The Hutzels were charged with uh, a violation of the Illinois Liquor Control Act. It was the first time in the history of the state of Illinois that anybody uh, had been charged under that statute for providing alcohol to minors. But here's the thing about it. The Hutzels never provided alcohol to the minors. What they did do was provide a venue for those uh, youngsters to consume the alcohol and did nothing to abate it. There wasn't one witness that testified at this trial that the Hutzels gave those kids liquor. Uh, the only witness that testified that put Mr. Hutzel in that basement uh, was one of uh, Tyler's friends. Uh, here's the thing about that. They called seven, the state called 17 kids to come in and testify. They gave them all what's called uh, use immunity. And what use immunity is, is basically this. Come in and testify under oath about what you did at that party. So if you drank alcohol, if you smoked pot, if you bought, brought alcohol in there, tell us that. We're not going to charge you, uh, but we're going to rely on your testimony in proving your case. Which means as a trial judge, I had to vet every single one of those those agreements, those uh, use immunity agreements, which means this is a practical matter. All 17 of those teenagers had to go hire lawyers. Those lawyers had to negotiate uh, that agreement with the state. I had to vet that agreement to, to make sure that's what the, the, the minors wanted to do before they testified, and then they testified in a courtroom full of people that they didn't know, including the entire Chicago press corps. On average, I'd say that costs those kids and their families anywhere from $2,500 to $5,000 just to go in there and testify and secure that, that, that agreement. And I only know that because when the whole thing was done, I asked the, the defense attorneys what they charged. So that's probably um, more than you need to know, but the reason I mention it is this stuff gets expensive. And certainly got more expensive for the Hudsons. So can you go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, the police started to canvass the areas they want to do, you know, when they do these things. Found liquor bottles along, along the, the driveway. They, they popped the trash cans in the garage. There is sort of the Toby Keith red solo cups that everyone thinks is such a cute and clever song. There you go. That's how cute and clever it can be. Go ahead, next slide. There's more. Go ahead. More. More. And more. That's the Bell's car. That's the carnage uh, folks that happened. Um, go to the next one. That's Danny Bell's car where it was towed to. Um, and you can see sort of what I described, I think, at least I hope, uh, how that car ended up in the condition that it ended up. Go ahead. That's, uh, if you go back one more, you can sort of see, see where that yellow tarp is? That was what was covering it. Ross when the police rolled up on the scene. You go ahead. And then that's just a, another example. There's a better shot of it. Um, so the Hutzels went to trial. At the time, the violation of the Liquor Control Act uh, was just a class A misdemeanor. The most they could have gotten was a year in jail, a fine of $2,500 or both of those things, or they could have been placed on uh, probation for up to 24 months. The law has since changed. Uh, now it's a class 4 felony if you violate the Liquor Control Act, and that means either providing the alcohol or a place. Uh, and it mirrors probably most of the social hosting ordinances in your local communities. Um, if you provide a place for alcohol to be consumed, um, then you do nothing to abate or do nothing to stop it. Um, you can be held liable. Now, if you just do that, it's a class A misdemeanor. So, however, if somebody's at that party and they leave and they're injured in a car accident or they suffer great bodily harm or death, you can go to prison for one to three years, up to six years, if you're eligible for an extended sentence. You could pay a fine of $25,000. Uh, you could also be placed on up to 30 months of probation or spend up to 18 months in local incarceration or periodic imprisonment. The, 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 um, Criminal 
punitive sanctions are tremendous. Absolutely tremendous. But that's not really as bad as it gets, because then the hustles turn around and they got sued civilly. Uh, here's the thing about that. There isn't an insurance company in the world that will indemnify you. Uh, if you knowingly break the law and in doing so, someone in your house gets injured. You're not on, you're, you're in all state, state farm, farmers, nationwide, none of them are on the hook. You're on the hook personally for that. Uh, now, the Hutzels got out of one lawsuit um, and they settled the other. And it was a sealed settlement. So, And I didn't handle the civil cases, so I can't tell you exactly what it was, but I'm led to believe that it was not an inexpensive problem. Let me just give you a real quick snapshot of what they had to go through. Uh, and, I, and again, when I say what they had to go through, I'm not saying that because, excuse me, I'm not saying that because I feel sorry for them. I'm just trying to give you an idea of how somebody who one morning is your neighbor, say one Saturday morning, that person hosts a party, and then the next Sunday morning they're getting perp walked out the, uh, I don't know, the Lombard police station because somebody got killed in their basement and they drank too much or they drove and they killed themselves or somebody else. This is what they, they went through. They were hounded to and from their car to the courthouse every day by the media. Uh, their pictures were plastered all over the papers. Uh, I had a friend that works for Abbott, which is a big pharmaceutical company in Lake County, who was uh, traveling in London and he's reading a editorial in the London Times about the hustle case after the verdict comes back. So this is international news. CNN covered it. Uh, Fox covered it. Um, but really, honestly, that's not the worst of it. In my opinion. When it's humiliating, it's embarrassing, it's your worst mistake ever being played out on the nightly news every night for a week straight. Um, that's still not the worst of it. The worst thing is they've got to live with this. Tyler's got to live with this. He's got to live with the fact that he basically almost bankrupted everything his parents had ever worked for. He's got to live with the fact that his parents had to move from the community that they invested so much in. I don't mean financially, I mean of themselves, and becoming part of the fabric of that community. The Hustles have to live with the fact that two boys died in their front yard. That doesn't go away. I don't think you ever accept that. I don't know how you ever deal with it, but that's their reality. That, to me, is the worst of it. And I say that to you because I like to think I'm one of you. When I say that, I mean this. I've got one that's a sophomore in college. I've got one that's a senior in high school, and I've got one in eighth grade that's going to high school next year. I used to have really nice brown hair, and look what they've done to me. <laughs> it's scary. It's terrifying. And as hard as you think it is on you, it's harder on them. And here's what I mean about that. When I started high school, it was the 70s. The 70s were a lot different. Police and police officers' attitudes towards all this was a lot different. These kids, and I don't mean to speak of their, their students here, I don't mean to call you kids, but um, these young men and women are, are growing up in a zero tolerant world. Um, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? I don't know. But it is what it is. Uh, look, there's plenty of laws that the General Assembly passes that I don't like, and I'm powerless to do anything about it because I'm sworn to follow the laws that's given to me, just like all of you are. That's the reality. Um, something happened in that trial that shocked me. Some of the boys that were given use immunity testified Tuesday and Wednesday of that trial. We closed on a Saturday morning. And closing arguments began on about 10 o'clock. I get there about 7.30, I'm going through my notes, I'm getting everything organized, I'm looking at the jury instructions. There's a knock on my door, and it's the deputy, and he said, well, the lawyers want to come back and talk to me. I'm thinking, no, this can't possibly be good. Uh, so I said, fine, bring it back. And uh, they said, Judge, we just want to tell you what happened last night. I said, okay, tell me. He said, well, and I, I, and I apologize, I don't recall the two boys' names, but two of the boys that testified during the trial uh, that were at that party were arrested that Friday night for possessing and consuming alcohol. And you say, and I, I remember thinking to myself, how 
stupid could uh, these boys be? How dumb can they be? And I, and I retract that. And I know why it is that they do these things. And, 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 and I will tell you, and I, and I should say I know why they did it. I suspect what a lot of it has to do with is this. Um, we didn't know in the 70s, or the 80s, frankly, and it wasn't until the 90s where technology sort of opened a, a window to the brain that didn't previously exist, uh, how the, uh, particularly the adolescent male brain develops. And the reality is this, the adolescent, when, when you're boys, and I've got them, I love them, but it, it, he, he does some staggering, bizarre things to me. You know, like, for example, we were in California for a wedding last weekend, his cousin got married. We're all excited. We haven't seen him since Christmas. He's going to school out in North Carolina. Flies in, and I said, great. Where's your suit? What suit? The one you're supposed to wear to the wedding. All right, so, hello. You know, thankfully, that's the goofiness that he engages in. Here's the goofiness that these guys engage in. The part of the brain that deals with judgment and reasoning doesn't fully develop in an adolescent male until they're 23, 24 years old. The part of the brain that's affected most by alcohol and drugs is, guess what, the part of the brain that deals with judgment and reasoning. So, they're at a genetic disadvantage. Uh, not to beat up my gender, but, you know, the reason we did stupid things when we were boys is, well, because frankly, we're not terribly bright. And we don't get terribly bright until we're about 23 or 24. Incidentally, that was when I ended my two-year hiatus working for the Hilton Hotels and decided, guess what, this isn't a career, I'm going to law school. So it, 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 they're sort of wired that way. Girls are slightly better, but not much. So when the, our kids make these decisions and do these things, I'm here to defend them. I'm here to defend them in, in, in this regard. They're entitled to a little slack. I have a hard time, frankly, reconciling that with some of the zero tolerance stuff that's handed down. But I'm still not going to tag zero tolerance. Here's why. I know in this community there have been some issues regarding alcohol and sanctions and things that have been handed down over the last 12 months. And it, it's very hard. I mean, my, my kids are all athletes. My kids have all invested an enormous amount of time into their sports. They work hard. They work hard in school. They're all, I love them to death. They're the most important thing to me in the world. And when they make mistakes, and they haven't, but when kids make mistakes and they lose time in a sport, I understand how sad that is and how devastating that is. But here's the thing I want you to walk away from here tonight. What would you rather have, the conversation with your child about losing 20% of your season, or the conversation with your child about losing your house, or about losing their college fund, or about their friend losing their life? I think the last three are much more difficult conversations to have. And as much as it may be disappointing to you and to them and to their teammates for them to have to sit out, it's a far better consequence than going to the funeral home when they're, they're funeral or, they're, or visiting uh, them in custody in the DuPage County Jail. So my advice to every parent is God bless you and good luck. Um, be fearless in the conversations that you have with your kids. It goes by so fast, uh, as you all know. Um, my guess is your kids would welcome the conversation as uncomfortable as it may be. Um, talk about these things, get on the same page. And if you're not on the same page, understand that it may take some time to get there. Uh, thanks for listening, and if you have any questions,